Good morning and um, welcome to class. Sorry for the slight delay. I was not able to join into the class. It was not just allowing me to uh, join. So I had to, we tried different ways and then finally had to shut down and restart and then it uh, worked, thank God. So apologize for the delay. We'll begin. Uh, can I ask uh, one of you to please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Anyone would like to lead us in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day and for this wonderful moment. We thank you for the gift of life that you've given to us. Lord, we still thank you for the, le for the lesson we are going to have. We pray that we are blessed and we also bless our teacher. We still thank those who have not yet come to also come in the name of the Lord. We do pray that we take, we learn a lot that's going to help us do our last assessment. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. Just give me a minute, please. Okay. So um, on Monday, we began studying um, Romans chapter 15, and um, we uh, stopped at verse 21. Uh, we basically were looking at verses 14 uh, to 21, where we were um, looking at Paul just sharing some of his own personal thoughts. And um, he talks about the grace of God that was upon his life. And why is he mentioning about the grace of God in verses uh, uh, 15 to 21 is because he's saying that, you know, he's been so confident and bold in uh, writing to them and telling them, you know, how they need to relate with each other, how they need to treat each other, how they need to serve each other. And uh, he says that, you know, he's using this boldness um, because of the grace of God in his life or over his um, life. And he's mentioning this because, you know, he's not uh, been there to Rome before. He has not mentored the church. He's not started the church. He's no spiritual leader over the churches at uh, Rome. He's no, has no, uh, you know, spiritual leadership authority over them because he's not founded the church. Um, but he's saying he's using this boldness to write to them about all of these uh, matters and how they need to relate with each other, need to treat each other, serve each other is because of the grace of God uh, in his um, life. And he says that, you know, the grace of God in his life has made him to be a minister to the Gentiles, okay? And um, because of the grace of God over his life, he says he's able to um, preach the gospel from Jerusalem to Ilkrim. Uh, Ilkrim is modern-day Albania, and uh, he's able to proclaim the gospel uh, in all of these places where the gospel has, um, some of those places where the gospel has not been uh, reached, he has taken the gospel there, and he's done it through the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, and he's done it with uh, boldness because the grace of God that has been uh, given to him. And so he's saying that because of the grace of God in his life, he is able to do what he's doing, and he's doing it uh, boldly. Uh, and uh, he says that he's able to do it boldly because, and he's able to admonish the churches, he's able to tell them what they need to do, what they shouldn't do, how they need to live their Christian life, what are the things they need to put in order in the church, uh, is because he says that uh, I have, you know, not only have the grace of God over my life, but he says that I've also proved that grace. 
Okay, so it's, it's important that we prove uh, the grace of God over our lives. So one thing that we can learn from uh, verses 15 to 21 uh, in Romans chapter 15 is that, you know, we have the grace of God over our lives. The grace of God uh, and the gifts of God is given to us to uh, equip us, to empower us, to fulfill a specific function, a calling that God has given to us in the body of um, uh, Christ. Okay, so grace we know is divine enablement, divine character and divine uh, favor. Okay, so... Uh, Paul is saying that he has received this grace and this grace has equipped him uh, to take the gospel where it has not been, uh, you know, uh, uh, established before. That's why he says that I established the work where it has not been done before and it's I don't build on someone else's um, uh, foundation because he says it's the grace of God to preach the gospel where it has not been preached um, before. And he says that even as this grace of God is over my life, uh, you know, I'm able to prove it because you are able to see the work that I have done. Okay. Um, how is he able to prove it is because he says that, you know, he's proved the grace of God over his life because the Gentiles have um, come to uh, accept the gospel right from Jerusalem to Illicrim, wherever he's preached. And he's preached the gospel with mighty signs, miracles, and wonders, uh, which has led the Gentiles to obedience of Jesus Christ. And also, he has established the work of God. He has established believers. He's established churches in a place where there has no one uh, else has gone before and worked or, or uh, preached the gospel uh, there. And so he says that, you know, because of all of the grace that is in his life is being able to establish uh, the work of God. And um, uh, so we learn two things from, you know, this passage, that we need to know the grace of God over life. And we, uh, uh, you know, uh, and we, we can, once we know the grace of God in our life, we need to prove it. How do we prove it? You know, we prove it by, you know, by moving in that grace. So what do I mean when, we, when I say that we move in the grace? It means that, you know, how we exercising it, you know, how we are practicing the grace in the way that we live, uh, in the way that we uh, go about doing ministry, you know, uh, the way that we pray for others, the way that we minister to others, the way that we preach and teach the gospel, you know, to others is a way that we are actually moving in the grace and we are actually uh, proving the grace of God over our lives. So when people um, see our life and our ministry, you know, they're able to see the grace of God, the favor of God, the character of God, uh, the divine enablement of God over our lives um, and the calling that he has um, given to us. So the first thing that we can learn is to know the grace of God in your life uh, by proving it. And secondly, that when you know the grace, you can move in it boldly. Okay, so you can move boldly to do what God has called you to do, to accomplish what God has called you to do and the task that he has uh, uh, set you apart to um, do. And he says, because he has proved the grace of his life, you know, and uh, the believers at various places uh, are able to see the life and the ministry of Paul, he says, because of this, uh, on, or based on this, I'm able to write all of these things to do uh, for you to practice and follow and uh, to take into consideration and do it because it is what, you know, uh, because the grace of God that is over my um, life. Okay. Otherwise, people can question Paul's authority. You know, who is he to tell us? You know, why is he writing all this to us? He's not even come and met us. He doesn't even know us as a church. He doesn't know us believers. You know, so uh, Paul, look at how very, how beautifully he, you know, talks about the grace of God over his life and using that to tell them, hey, this is the reason why I'm writing to you. And, and this is the boldness that I'm using. Uh, you know, to tell you how to live your lives. It's not just because I'm asking you to do it, but I have practiced it myself and I'm able to do it because of the grace of God over my life. And I just love the way um, Paul is such a good 
um, you know, <clears throat> not only good in how he ministers, how he goes about doing the building the kingdom of God, his uh, life, his testimony, uh, but also such a wonderful writer. You know, uh, it's the amazing. Uh, writing skills and of course it is the Holy Spirit that is uh, uh, imparting uh, to him and uh, you know getting him to write all of these things and so such powerful truths that uh, we can learn from Paul's writing and what the Holy Spirit is imparting through uh, him okay um, so he says you know I have gone about preaching and teaching the gospel where uh, uh, not where Christ was named that means Paul did not want to build on another man's foundation rather he wanted to do a, a, you know a pioneering work for the Lord uh, not because of pride why do you think Paul did not uh, build on somebody else's foundation or why do you think he went and started the work where nobody else was willing to go Why do you think Paul went where no one else was going and ministering? Any thoughts? Maybe he was led by the Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you, Lubegia. He was led by the Holy Spirit. Pastor, he was called to do this thing. Like pioneer ministry okay he was called to be an apostle to be a pioneer okay we also see that when he was in jerusalem what happened to him when he was preaching there was a lot of mistrust with people there and we see how they took him through a basket so maybe he feared saying let me go the other side and his passion also has a lot to a lot to pray to play thank you yes yes thank you lubega uh i'll just share my thoughts i'm not sure if i'm right but then uh because uh he was called for the gentiles also might be one of the reason because we see people they first only reached the jews mm -hmm. uh, and uh out of that Paul Paul he started this reaching out to the Gentiles and he explained why he's reaching out to the Gentiles and how God is moving. Maybe that might be one of the reasons because he is laying the foundation for the Gentiles. That's what I feel like. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for your inputs. Uh yes, maybe because there was so much to do on the frontiers, you know, so much to do in the borders, the boundaries, the borderline, you know, um uh just to go where no one was going. So that they can reach the unreached okay uh, so that was a, a good um, you know initiative of Paul and he says but as it is written so Paul saw his pioneering heart as obedience to the uh, scriptures fulfilling you know uh, the passage that he quotes from the Old Testament in verse 21 he says but as it is written to whom he was not announced they shall see and those who have not heard shall understand so paul is saying that he is going where uh, no one has gone before and he is beginning a work where no one has built on is also because you know he's doing it in obedience to scripture he's fulfilling you know uh, uh, what is quoted in the old testament and he uh, quotes from uh, you know he quotes scripture passage in verse 21 so we know that you know paul was a learned man he was well versed in the torah and the old testament so um maybe also that was another reason and the holy spirit also guiding him and leading him uh to go to the frontiers okay uh, we'll move on to verses 22 to 33 uh, where paul is sharing some of his travel plans uh, before that anyone has any questions So I'd like you all to focus on, you know, know what is the grace of God over your life, what is your full calling, your function, know the grace and the gifts, and, uh, you know, uh, not just know your grace and gifts, move in the grace, you know, uh, by pr exercising, practicing it in your living, in your life, in your ministry, and prove the grace of God over your life. And even as you do that, you know, move in boldness, even as God gives you the 
poll list. Okay, uh, we'll move on to verses 22 to 33. If no one has any questions, any doubts, any thoughts you'd like to share. Okay, if not, we will, uh, can someone read verses 22 to 33, please, for us? For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while, but now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achiria to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of these spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and I have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by the way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in fullness of blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service to Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may not come to you with, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. For the Lord, for the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So here Paul is sharing his travel plans in verses 22 to 33. And uh, he says in verse um, 22, for this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. So do you think Paul wanted to visit the church at Rome? Was he desirous? Was he eager to visit the church at Rome? What do you all think? Always, always, always. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, uh, maybe because uh, Rome was, you know, a big city, well-known, established city, and uh, he's heard so much about the, the believers there. And I think he was his great desire to um, visit uh, or meet the believers at Rome. But he says, uh, for this reason, I've also been much hindered from coming to you. So what is the reason? It says, this reason, I've also been much hindered. What is the reason and what has hindered him from, you know, visiting the church at Rome? So because of that. Yes, uh, Jeffina, thank you, smart. She says, look at the previous verse. Uh, it says, for this reason means, you know, Paul is basically continuing what he's writing. So he's saying, for this reason means he's saying that, you know, uh, the verse 20, where it says, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not by Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. So he says, I've going to places where, you know, the word has not been preached before, not building on somebody else's foundation. And he says, you know, this is what has in hindered me, or for this reason, you know, I've not been able to come and visit you because there's so many places that, you know, I need to go and preach the gospel where no one has gone um, before, okay? So Paul is writing this letter from Corinth uh, towards his third missionary journey. 
and he plans to go to Jerusalem uh, because he has collected some money for uh, some churches in Achaia and Macedonia. Uh, you know, he's collected from the money from the churches in Achaia and Macedonia to take it to the churches at Jerusalem because the churches at, the, at Jerusalem, you know, uh, the, uh, the people at Jerusalem were facing a famine and so there must have been lack there. Surely there was lack there. And so he wants to provide for them. And so he's collected some money from the churches in Achaia and Macedonia. And he's planning to go first to Jerusalem to meet the needs of the believers there. Then he plans to go to Spain. And on his way to Spain, he plans to stop at um, uh, Rome. Okay. Um, and he has this assurance that when he comes to Rome, uh, he says in verse 29. What does he say in verse 29? What is the assurance that he has uh, when he comes to Rome? In verse 29, what does he say? Verse 29. It says, he shall come to them in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of um, Christ. Okay, so a very important phrase uh, from this phrase or this verse, you know, comes the term full gospel. You know, there are churches who are called the full gospel churches. And uh, why is why are they called as the full gospel churches? Any idea? Or what does Paul mean when he talks, I shall come to you in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ? Or why are these churches named as full gospel churches? Any thoughts, any ideas? I can give an example of a local full gospel church that I know and what they speak of themselves. They say that they have both faith and miracles, that the Holy Spirit works in them. Thank you. Absolutely right. Thank you, Lubega. Yes, you know, um, so Paul is saying that when he comes to minister to them, you know, he will share the fullness, the blessing, the gospel of Christ, which means, or, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the full gospel churches, when they share the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're not only talking about uh, the gospel that brings about forgiveness of sins, but also the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings healing to the bodies and deliverance from every demonic power, which means, uh, you know, just not just preaching the word, teaching the word that brings about uh, reconciliation and forgiveness of sins, but also you know, uh, flowing in signs, miracles, and wonders, the gospel that brings about healing to the mind, to the soul, um, and also deliverance from demonic powers, okay? Verse 30, he says, you strive together with me in prayers to God uh, for me. So, you know, um, Paul is at Corinth, and the believers that he is writing to are at Rome, and he says, I want you to strive with me in um, prayer, okay? Um, though they are in different places, yet, you know, uh, they can come alongside to pray for each other. So, you know, we can strive together with other believers, even if they are in different parts of the city, different parts of the nation, different parts of the world, you know, come alongside with other people, uh, and we can lend them our spiritual strength, even as we pray with them, um, Sorry for the background noise. There's some work, construction work going on just in the in the neighboring compound. So you know um, we can lend our spiritual strength as we pray with them, uh, even though we are at different places. But we can still come together in agreement uh, in prayer when we strive to uh, together. Okay, what is the meaning of strive together? When Paul says strive together with me, what does he mean? The Greek word basically means, you know, the Greek little translation means agonize together. Okay. So it basically means to struggle in partnership with, uh, to struggle in company with, to strive, uh, to strive along with. So, you know, 
um, you know, just uh, engage in battling, in 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 fighting, in spraying um, uh, along with the other um, person. So, you know, um, from this same word, strive uh, comes the root word for the word agony, uh, which you know is used of Jesus when he was in great anguish in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And when Jesus asked his disciples to strive along with him, or that means to agonize with him in prayer. So basically saying, hey, you know, I'm struggling. So, you know, partner with me in my struggle. Accompany me with my with me in my struggle. Come along with me in my um, struggle. So Jesus is asking his disciples to agonize with him in prayer. But we see that they failed, you know, to pray along with him. They were so sleepy, they fell asleep. You know, they failed at that most important part of Jesus' life to strive along with him, to agonize along with him. Um, and, you know, but we learn a lesson from this that even when, you know, other brothers and sisters are going through challenges, they're facing difficulties, you know, um, uh, when you pray for them, you're actually striving along with them. You're you're with them in the struggle, partnering with them, in company with them, you know, together with them in their battle. Um, and when you are striving with them, agonizing with them in prayer, you're basically, you stepped into the fight along with them. So their fight is your fight, you know, uh, their conflict is your conflict. You are in this conflict along with them. And, uh, you know, even as they are battling it all out, you are there along with them in partnership, in company with them. Uh, basically, their strength is uh, enforced because you're praying along with them. And this is how we can come alongside each other and reinforce each other. So sometimes we think, hey, what, what, what is going to happen if I'm just going to pray for somebody who's far away and they're going through the struggle I've heard, you know, pray for this prayer request, pray for that prayer request. You're basically striving along with them. You're there with them in the fight. You stepped with them, uh, stepped into the fight along with them, in the conflict with them. And it, it does, uh, you know, miracles. It does wonders. Uh, their strength is being enforced and uh, you are alongside with them. Uh, and you're alongside with each other, uh, reinforcing each other, strengthening each other, and building each other um, up. And so Paul, you know, um, uh, is saying, strive together with me in prayers to God for uh, me. So when Apostle Paul himself, you know, is asking the church, hey, you know, please come along with me, strive along with me in prayer, surely, you know, you and I also need to do that as um, well, okay, we need to strive together with others in um, prayer. And uh, what is he asking for them to pray along with him? Um, you know, he knows that even as he goes to Jerusalem, uh, you know, uh, those in Judea, those who do not believe, are going to cause an uproar, they're going to uh, you know, persecute him, they're going to cause him harm and danger. He knows the impending danger that is uh, looming large over him. And so, you know, he wants the brothers and sisters in Christ to pray um, uh, with him, along with him, uh, and step uh, into the battle or the fight that and the conflict that he is uh, going uh, uh, that is going on in his life or he's going to face uh, to be alongside with him, so to strengthen him, okay? Verse 31, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who would not believe that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So uh, Paul knew that the church in Jerusalem was, a very, was very conservative and sometimes, you know, they saw men as like Paul or they regarded men like Paul to be, you know, uh, some uh, dangerous innovators, uh, you know, people who are... Uh, dangerous leaders or reformers or uh, people who are visionaries uh, or developers. And so for this reason, he asked the church at Rome to pray that his service for the people of Jerusalem may be acceptable to the uh, saints. Because basically the, the believers at, uh, at Jerusalem, the church is Jerusalem are Jews and he's uh, an apostle to the Gentiles. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that... Um, um, that was that they did not, uh, you know, agree with Paul. But so Paul is saying, you know, pray for 
uh, me. But we see that even as Paul goes to Jerusalem, he's captured there by the Jews. And uh, for two years, he's imprisoned in Citeria. And, uh, you know, he uh, finally appeals to Caesar. And then he is taken to Rome as a prisoner. So he eventually ends up in Rome, uh, not as a free man, but as a prisoner. And even as he's brought in Rome, uh, you know, he's under house arrest, which allows him um, a little freedom for people to come and meet and talk and to preach and to teach, um, you know, not as a free man, but, you know, even though he's in chains, he's still able to believe, uh, minister to the believers at uh, Rome. So you see that, you know, Paul had this great desire to go and meet the believers at Rome. Uh, but, you know, all th the plans had changed, but he eventually ended up in Rome. But you see, irrespective of the way that he landed in Rome as a prisoner, it did not deter him or it did not stop him from ministering and preaching and teaching or breaking his heart. We see that he still uses the opportunity to uh, minister to the saints, to the believers uh, there. So we do not know, uh, something that we can learn from this is we do not know, uh, you know, what tomorrow holds um, and what um, are uh, the things that we're going to face but you know whatever we face we can use as opportunities to still uh, fulfill the calling that God has uh, in our um, lives okay so although the circumstances were different he was able to uh, minister to the believers okay and then he uh, ends this part of his letter or the uh, he says now the God of peace be with you all uh, amen. This is not the end of his letter, though, um, you know, but Paul concludes this part of the letter here by, you know, his personal, um, uh, you know, blessings that he's given. He's saying, the God of peace be with you all. But, uh, you know, he goes on to, to talk about uh, various things. And then he finally ends his letter with his personal greetings in Romans chapter 16. Okay. So that is uh, Romans chapter 15 for us. Um, any thoughts, anything that you'd like to share? Anything that you all didn't understand, you want me to explain again? Any queries, any questions you'll have? No? Okay. If there are no queries or questions, then we'll move on to chapter 16, which is final greetings and uh, farewell. Okay. Um, okay. We'll read verses, um, uh, we'll read chapter 16. Um, there are 27 verses. So if all of you can read, five of you can read the. Uh, you know, five or six verses, it can help. Yeah. So who like to begin from verse 1, Romans chapter 16? I commend you, commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Kincrea, and that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia into Christ. Greet Mary, who labor, labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Can someone else continue reading from verse 8? Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved. Greet Ap 
Apelles, approved in Christ, greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus, greet Herodian, my countryman, greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord, greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet um, Philologus and Julia, Marius and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Roslyn. Can someone else continue reading from verse uh, seven, 17? Yes. Yeah. I urge, I, now I urge you, brethren, not, this, not these who cause division and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which we learned, which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but they are only very and by smooth words and flattering, flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of your Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lu Lucius, Jason, and Sosipata, my kinsman, greet you. I, Tatirius, who wrote this ep epistle, greet you in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. Okay. We finish, we have to ask few more verses, right? We need to read some more verses, right? Lubega, you read two verses? I read up to verse 22. 22, yes. Can somebody read from verses 23 to verse 27, please? Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the treasurer, treasurer of the city, greets you and quarters a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, now but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for the obedience to the faith, to God alone, wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Subhashis. Uh, when we read this passage, you know, uh, what is what impresses you in this passage? Romans chapter 16. There's so many names, it's like a tongue twister, but what impresses you? It shows that the, the work of the gospel is teamwork, not individual work. Amen. Yes. Uh, so the work of the gospel, God has, um, you know, given us specific functions and those functions are all linked, interlinked with each other because we are one body in Christ. You know, we are all different parts and we have one head. And so it's important for us to uh, partner with each other. 
you know, com and even as we partner, we complement each other in building the kingdom of God and not com we should not compete with each other. You know, most of the time as ministers, we compete with each other rather than complement each other and coming together to build God's kingdom. Um, another th uh, thing is that, you know, we need to be mindful that it's even if God has called us to given us specific vision, specific function in the body of Christ, specific ministries, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, to set up a church or to set up a Christian ministry organization, whatever. Uh, it is not just uh, about our vision. It's not about just my church, but it is how. You know, I can use the vision that God has given me, the calling that God has given me to enhance or build the kingdom of God. So uh, we look at our calling, our vision, our function, the broader framework of building the kingdom of God because we are part of the kingdom of God. We're here to be stewards of the kingdom of God and we're here to build the kingdom of God. So we see that Paul is, even though he's a great apostle, he's pioneered so much so many churches he's established so many churches written so many um uh, you know uh, uh letters you know uh, ministered to so many people mentored so many men and women uh, he's actually you know all of his letters he closes off with greetings mentioning people uh, just to show that hey it's a teamwork it's not just i me my uh, self and i think um, it's a very important lesson to for us to learn that you know uh, it, uh, uh, christian ministry is not just my my business my work what god has entrusted to me but how i can use that to partner uh, with others um, and also how I can build the kingdom of God and what God has called me and entrusted me uh, with. Okay, so here we see that you know what is very impressive um, was also that Paul is recognizing people, right? He's recognizing people, he's thanking them. Do you think it was easy for them to write out all of these names? What do you think in those days was it easy to write in Paul's time? <laughs> Jeffina says just to remember the names itself is difficult. The people in your team, you know. Do you think it was easy for them to write all of these names uh, or write these scripts? No, why? <laughs> Zafina says in those days there's no computer, there's no pen, you just take a paper and a pen, you know, you can just write or uh, you can just, you know, type it out or, or they, uh, uh, it, it was parchments and, you know, it was painstaking, you know, it was a lot of effort they had to put into uh, basically write out. So if Paul is taking the the pain and the effort to mention so many names, it just means that he has people in his heart, you know, that is so important. Uh, another thing we need to remember is kingdom building or uh, 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 ministry is not about, you know, how many books you wrote, how many places you preached, how many churches you established, um, you know, your degrees, the fame, the name, uh, you know, all of that is not going to impress God. It's 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 writing into the hearts and lives of people. So when we have people in our hearts, you know, uh, uh, yeah, we can serve them better. We can serve them with the love of God, and you know, um, and when we have people in our hearts, we can actually write into their hearts. That means we can take the liberty to speak into their lives. We can take the liberty to preach and teach and admonish and correct and rebuke and train them in righteousness and holiness like Paul um, uh, is using the boldness and the liberty that's because he has people in his heart and when we have people in our heart God will give us the permission and God will give us the right to write into people's heart to speak into people's heart. So that is another very important thing that we need, we can learn from Paul, that he had people in his heart and so God gave him the liberty, the freedom, the right to speak into their lives, to write into their lives or to decree over their lives and to admonish them, teach them and to train them in righteousness and uh, holiness. Some of these truths we've already learned in uh, 
the Minister's Foundation class in the first year and also in the Kingdom of God and Kingdom uh, Builders. So even as we go about doing ministry, let's um, uh, be mindful of these things. Let us know the grace of God. You know, uh, let us move in the grace of God. Let us practice the grace and move boldly. Uh, let us know that we're here to build the kingdom of God. And even as we do that, we are here to minister to people and uh, have people in your heart so that God can give you the freedom and the liberty to speak over people and to uh, write into their um, hearts. Okay, we'll stop here. Um, we'll finish chapter 16 on Monday, which will be our last class. Um, um, I posted the assessment uh, uh, yesterday. Sorry for the delay. I've mentioned the reason. I've stated the reason there. So you can uh, submit your assessment uh, by next uh, uh, Thursday. Thank you all. Have a blessed weekend, and I will see you on Monday.